Mediterranean is the Middle Sea. There's many seas. Aegean, Tyrrhenian, Ionian, Adriatic. The great rivers meet and mingle. The Po and the Ephraim, the Rhone and the Arno, the Nile and the Tiber. The waters wash the shores of Asia, of Africa, of Europe. Waxing bold in the limelight of his conquering armies, grants an audience to his Axis partner from the Mediterranean. Flourish and pomp are an integral part of such meetings. Between them, these two, De Fiora and Il Duce, have arrogated to themselves the destiny of the old world, all its oceans, all its people. On the mountaintop headquarters in Berchtesgaden, called the Eagle's Nest. Plans are formulated to conquer the Mediterranean. Colonel General Yeovil, Hitler's personal chief of staff, urges reduction of Gibraltar and Suez. Seal off the inland sea and make it an Axis lake. The Italian Navy, deployed in three swift squadrons and manned by able crews, is a grave, powerful menace to the lifeline binding the British Commonwealth of Nations. A menace to the Allied world. Mediterranean at the outbreak of war. Famous for the speed of its cruisers and destroyers, the French sortie from their bases at Toulon, Algiers and Oran. Their hopes are high, their faith as yet unshattered. warns the Allied world that the safety of Great Britain and the Empire is powerful, though not decisive, affected by what happens to the French fleet. Control of the Mediterranean rests literally on a rock. Gibraltar, guardian of the narrow strait that leads from the Atlantic into the sea which serves as a moat around Hitler's southern flank. Natural fortress, indestructible sentinel, Gibraltar was ceded to the British by the Spanish in 1713. What nature has provided, the British through the centuries have improved. The rock is encrusted with armament, is alive with soldiers. The Royal Navy faces the longest odds in all its history in the coming battle for the Mediterranean. If the rock goes, North Africa and the Near East go with it. Duke of Gloucester, brother of the king, inspects the defenses. From Gibraltar, there is a 1,900-mile seaway, east to Suez, 
that must be kept open, that must be protected. rally around the rock. The ships gather for passage to Egypt and the Near East. Some will go to Malta, England's mid-Mediterranean island fortress, so urgently desired by the Axis, so vital to the Allies. On these ships rests the fate of empires. heads for Malta, the ship's officers face the harsh knowledge that the enemy is under, over, and on the sea route ahead. But officers and men remember the ancient words. It is upon the Navy, under the good providence of God, that the wealth, safety, and strength of the kingdom do chiefly depend. England's great decisions of the war is to strengthen her Mediterranean fleet while the British Isles are still in danger of German invasion. The Royal Navy, outnumbered and outgunned here, sweeps forth to clear the sea lane to Malta. Battleships like the King George V, manned by men to whom long odds are not a discouragement but a challenge, hold the Mediterranean open. Horsepower, 110,000. Speed, better than 30 knots. Yet the soul of the ship is not her machine, but the spirit of the English sailors who manned her. From the days of sail to the time of the turbine, that spirit has remained unaltered. It destroyed the Spanish Armada, smashed Napoleon at Trafalgar. In World War II, this spirit permeates the fleet. It is more formidable to Britain's foes than armor plate and cannon. Wars are not won by guns alone. The words, the great words of the Royal Navy's traditional prayer sustain the sailors in their peril. Eternal Lord God, who alone spreadest out the heavens and rulest the raging of the sea, who has compassed the waters with bounds until day and night come to an end. Be pleased to receive into thy almighty and most gracious protection the persons of us, thy servants, and the fleet in which we serve. Aboard a British man of war, there are five meal times a day. Coco on the morning watch, breakfast, dinner, tea, and a supper. The galleys of the King George V must feed a crew of 1,900 men. The captain assigns an officer to the mess deck to see if there are any complaints about the chow. of one-eighth of a pint of rum shall be issued to every rating over the age of 20. Those who do not drink get threepence a day, called grog money instead. 
The rum is issued neat to petty officers. For the other ratings, it is mixed with two parts water. Officers must supply their own spirits. The ship is more than a machine of war. It is a community of men. Between the salvos and assaults, between the hours of work and sleep, far from the world of chaos, safe in the world of memory, is one constant dream. And when peace and rest at length have come, all the day's long toil is past, each heart is whispering, home, home at last. sweet home, and that may be within the sound of bow bells in teeming London, where the blitz rages and the bombs destroy. Nor around thee thy wife and sweet little ones come, all clamoring joyous to snatch the first kiss, transporting thy bosom with exquisite bliss. Navy is stripped of her ally and must guard the far-flung battle line alone. In the Atlantic, in the Channel, in the Mediterranean. The clouds of catastrophe gather and the councils of despair urge that the Mediterranean be abandoned to the enemy. fears his fate too much, or his deserts are small, who dare not put it to the touch to win or lose it all. So for watch after watch, continuous, unbroken, undismayed, the Royal Navy carries on. Whichever way the aggressors turn in the Mediterranean, there stands Malta, a stumbling block in their path. But the tiny island, with its 275,000 people, must live from convoys that fight through. The enemy is only 60 miles away in Sicily. Whoever holds Malta controls the central Mediterranean, 
and the British hold on to it like a bulldog. The British and the Maltese themselves. From times unimaginably remote, the waves of history have washed over Malta. The ordeals of the past pale before the present incessant threat of terror from the sky. mount by fives and by tens, by dozens and by scores, by the hundreds. And still the Luftwaffe sends out more of its bombers to blast, to burn, to butcher Malta.
17 months, Martha lives through a nightmare of attack. The Maltese fight terror and hunger with inadequate means, but with unbreakable defiance. Proudly, the score is kept. Air raid number 1,774. But the Axis has its grim statistics, too. 1,129 enemy planes break against the island of Malta. And the people of Malta, 1,468 dead. The Grand Harbor of Malta becomes a shambles of rubble and twisted steel. Ships that survived the long, long voyage from England are smashed into useless hulks at journey's end. The bottom of Malta's harbor is littered with the skeletons of ships that died to keep the island alive. The waste and wreckage of war clutter mile upon mile of the ocean floor. A cemetery of the sea. Dead ships dead sailors, dead hopes. But life goes on. Through endless ages, aggressors have battered at the gates of Malta, have had their hour and disappeared. The Carthaginians came and vanished. Islam engulfed the island and ebbed away. The Goths came plundering in the Vandal's rage, but history swallowed up both Goth and Vandal. The Maltese remained. Malta's ordeal, King George VI pays a sailor's tribute to the island's allegiance to the Royal Navy. All the bells and all the churches ring, and all the people greet His Majesty. Here in the Mediterranean are the elements on which aggression shatters. The King, the people, the Royal Navy.